I want to start by saying welcome everybody who's here with us. Thanks for being here. Also for everybody who's at home tuning in, what a thrill for us to be able to be with you and to speak with you. Hopefully you found the outline. Uh, Kelly's been doing a great job posting those there on the Facebook link. And so hopefully you are finding that. And we're going to jump right in as we go for part two on our teaching, Defeating the Giant of Depression. And I thought everybody needed a little bit of levity, okay? Anybody want a little bit of humor today? Okay. So this lady, she dies. And she's standing there at the pearly gates, right? Oh, it's hilarious. She's standing at the pearly gates. She's greeted by Peter. And uh, Peter says, well, you can't come in just yet. First, you got to be able to spell a word correctly. And the lady asks, well, what word? Peter says, whatever word you want, any word you want to spell. So she says, love, L-O-V-E. Peter says, awesome, welcome to heaven. And he says, you know, I need to run an errand. Would you mind covering my post for me just for a moment? And if anybody co comes along, you just follow the exact same routine. Great. So she's covering the pearly gates. And here in few minutes later, her ex-husband came, comes walking forward. And she says, what are you doing here? He says, I just had a heart attack. Did I make it to heaven? She says, not yet. You've got to be able to spell a word correctly. And he asks, what word? There's a long pause. And she says, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> All right. A little bit of humor there. Okay, yeah, that's a groan. Steve, no groaning allowed. Okay, so last week, okay, we started out here, week one on this teaching, Defeating the Giant of Depression, and we took a look at the greatest prophet in the Bible, Elijah, and discovered that he himself, this mighty man of God, himself felt depression to the point where he felt like he wanted to die. And as we looked at him, there were some things that we discovered that kind of led to his depression. Feelings like being isolated and alone can leave you feeling depressed. But God has an answer for that. It's called the church family. It's called God saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He felt like he'd run out of options, that he was, uh, you know, at the end of his rope, and, you know, with God, he is very creative. And with God, you are never at the end of your rope. You know, another thing we discovered is a lack of proper rest. He was exhausted. He's fainted there in the desert. And he tells us, you know, that he drank water, he ate bread, and he took a long nap. And, you know, this week I tried to be as spiritual as I could. I took a few naps this week. Anybody else took some naps this week? Oh, man, I felt so close to Jesus we also discovered that when you drift away from understanding your purpose, why you're here. You remember, he had just called down fire the day before that consumed the altar, uh, the, the sacrifice. Do you remember that story? And now here he is. He's running for his life. He's hiding out in a cave. And God confronts him. He says, what are you doing here? Have you forgotten you're the mighty prophet of God that I'm with you? And, you know, when you forget who you are and why you're here, it can really lead to depression. You know, you guys, you are, the, you are a child of God. You've been created in his, in his image. And God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life. We also learn the danger of a fatalistic perspective. When you use language like it will never or it always that's fatalistic language. And, you know, uh, the prophet did the very same thing when, when the Lord says, what are you doing in this cave? And, uh, and he says, essentially, he says, well, they've killed all the prophets, and I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. When, in fact, there were still 7,000 prophets of God that had not bowed a knee to Baal. And it wasn't everybody hunting for him. It was just Jezebel the queen. So we talked about some of the things that cause depression, but I hope that today, as we talk about some of the things that help us get past it, that this will be very, very helpful for you. So today, I want to talk with you about how to defeat the giant of depression. Last week, we talked about some of the causes, but today, I want to talk with you about how to get past it, get over it. 
Would that be good for any of you today? Amen. Well, so I'm going to use an illustration here, and imagine with me that this, uh, this picture represents your life. And this other picture of water right here, this represents everything that God wants to pour into your life. Things God wants you to be full of all the good things that he wants to pour into your life. So help me out a little bit. What would you say are some of the things God wants to pour into your life? Okay. So somebody said love, L-O-V-E. And so this cup here, this represents that God wants to pour love into your life. But here's the problem. You notice it's, you know, 80% full of gravel. And that's what we do. This is when God wants love in our life, but we've allowed things like hate and unforgiveness in our lives. It taints the love. And so rather than being able to be filled with all the love that God intends for us to have, we, it ends up being restricted. Okay, what's something else that God wants in our life? Okay, God wants peace. He wants peace in our lives. He wants you to be able to find perfect rest. The turmoil wouldn't be there. And so what's the opposite of peace? The opposite of it? Of peace? Worry? Anxiousness? Okay? And so we allow anxious thoughts and worry to come into our lives. And so rather than being filled with perfect peace, we've got a lot of anxious thoughts and worry that we end up pouring in there as well. And that inhibits the peace level. How about joy? Would we all agree that God wants us to be filled with joy? But instead of joy, we do a lot of grumbling. We do a lot of complaining. And that, rather than joy, it allows negativity and discouragement in our lives. And so rather than being full of joy, we've got some of that grumbling, negative feelings inside of us as well. I think we would all agree that God wants us to be full of faith, right? But rather than faith, we end up with doubt, we end up with unbelief, and we end up pouring that in there as well. And the favor of God, we've talked a lot about God's favor over the last few months. And you know, the opposite of favor would be feelings of lack, feelings that somehow God doesn't quite have what's needed to meet my needs. We forget that God's hands are always full, that His favor is upon us, but rather than us experiencing the full, abundant favor of God, we end up pouring in some things that inhibit that. And so what ends up happening is when it comes time for God to fill us with all the good things, you can see it goes in. It's going in there, but it's not going in near to the degree that God intends for it to. You've got these things in your life You've come to church and you say, God, fill me with joy. Fill me with faith. Fill me with peace. And he's pouring that in, but there's a problem. You're not experiencing it to the degree that God wants you to because you've poured in so much negative stuff. And I would submit to you that the degree in which you've allowed the negative to fill your life is the degree in which you end up experiencing depression in your life. And so what do we need to do, everybody? It's pretty obvious. We need to dump out the negative. We got to dump it out. We got to say, Lord, I give you all the ugly stuff in my heart. Empty it out, man. Forgive me. And now what happens now is when we say, fill me, Lord. Fill me with your joy. Fill me with your peace. Fill me with your favor, your goodness. And he doesn't just stop at the top. He keeps going. And you know when you keep going, I don't know if you can see it at home, but what's happening is there's a cleansing that's taking place right now. The residue, the residual dirt that was in this pitcher as it continues to pour, and he doesn't stop. As he keeps pouring into your life, the impurity, the negativity, it all starts to wash out of your life. Amen? So I want to talk with you about some practical tips on how you can do this, 
how you can defeat the giant of depression. And the first thing is this, and we all, I've got to learn this, I'm sure you do as well, is we have got to learn to live by his daily allotment of grace, his daily allotment of compassion and favor. Now, we know that God has all favor, all grace, all compassion, but does he pour all of it out on you at one time? No, he doesn't. The Bible tells us in Lamentations that his compassions, they never fail. It says they are new when? Every morning. They were new every morning. Now, in Matthew, it says this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about that because tomorrow has enough concerns of its own. Now, listen, even AA understands this principle with this phrase right here. They say, I can make it, what? One day at a time. I'm not worried about the Christmas party and whether I'm going to make it there. I'm not worried about sometime next week. I'm just concerned with today. I make it one day at a time. And you know what so often we do is we burn up the grace, the compassion, what God is pouring out into us today to give us to get through today's problems because we end up worrying about yesterday or worrying about tomorrow. Several years ago when I first got into whitewater rafting, some buddies of mine and I, we'd heard about this river up in eastern Washington called the Tieton. And every September they drain Rim Rock Reservoir. And what happens is that river ends up just swelling up. You know, in September, rivers are dry, but this one is just ripping. And so we decided we were going to go up there. We'd heard about it, and we got up there. It was dark. And when we get out of the truck, sure enough, you could hear this thundering river, you know, going by. But you couldn't see it. We couldn't find a camp spot either. The place was packed. And what ends up happening is we met these guys, and they invited us to just kind of camp on the edge of their camp. And this one dude, man, he talked to us for like two hours about how wild this river was and everything that we could expect the next day and how terrible it was going to be. And quite frankly, he had us terrified. We didn't sleep very good that night. But you know the next morning when the sun came out and we were able to drive along because the road drove right along the whole, uh, ran along the whole river, and we were able to see what was there, and we couldn't figure out, what is this guy talking about? This doesn't look that bad. And sure enough, it was kind of an uneventful rafting trip, which is kind of what you want when you're running whitewater. Uneventful is actually pretty good. But, you know, we'd lost a whole night's sleep because we were totally stressed out about what was coming the next day. When had we just went ahead, got the rest, we would have seen that the next day it really wasn't that big of a deal. You guys, God knows everything. He knows what you're going to face today. He knows what you're going to face tomorrow. And he gives you the exact amount of grace you need for today. And tomorrow, he'll give you the grace you need for whatever you face then. And so you don't want to squander today's grace, today's compassions and mercies. You don't want to squander that, lamenting yesterday or worrying about tomorrow. You don't want to blow a hole in, the, in your spiritual tank, so to speak, and leak out today's supply, worrying about tomorrow. So one of the ways you overcome depression is you learn to rest in each day's allotment of grace. Secondly is this, is that you want to live by what you know, not by what you feel. Scripture tells us this, that we live by faith, not by sight. Now, do you believe that God is bigger than all your problems? Of course you do. You believe that God can meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus? Do you believe that he will never leave you and never forsake you? You believe that, but do you live that way? Do you live that way? And you know, your feelings can be very deceptive. And one of the most dangerous mantras that are out there is that if it feels good, just do it. 
That gets a lot of people in a lot of problems. Another terrible piece of advice is you just got to follow your heart. Just do what your heart is telling you. That's a dangerous piece of advice because Jeremiah tells us this. It says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Have you ever been driving at night when the fog is thick? And you, you don't have clarity. You can't really see clearly where you're going. But they paint a fog stripe, a fog line, right along the edge of the road so that your headlights will reflect off of that. And even though you may not be able to clearly see through the fog, you can see that fog line. And if you follow that, you're going to stay on the road. And for us, the Word of God is our fog line. You know, when that fog of depression settles upon you, you don't want to go by what you feel. Feelings have gotten a lot of people into a lot of trouble. It tells us, that the Word of God is living, it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. When you are going through a tough time, you go by the Word of God. It's like our fog line. It keeps us, it keeps us on the straight of narrow, so to speak. Another thing we learn is this is that you want to get the focus off of yourself and on to serving others. You want to do that. Because one of the dangers with depression is it's really self-absorption. We end up getting focused on myself and all of my problems and how miserable my life is and how bad I have it. But, you know, if you just take a moment and you serve others for a moment, you start to discover there are other people that are going through some difficult times as well. It tells us to look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Several years ago when I had an operation for my Achilles tendon, I hadn't even recovered from the anesthesia. I just woke up. And they're saying, Mr. Pauly, come on. We got to get you up. We got to get you moving. Get these crutches. Get going. And I'm like, wait a minute, it's, my head's still all foggy. I haven't even woke up yet. We got to get you moving. Because they understood something. That once you get up, you get moving, the blood gets flowing, and now the healing will begin. And that is true with our lives. Is that when you get up, get the focus off yourself, start focusing on somebody else and helping care for them, it's like the spiritual blood starts to move, starts to pump, and now you'll begin to heal up yourself. Now, we have two really great opportunities for people to jump in here. One for the early birds and one for those that like to sleep in. For you early birds, just come in on a Sunday at 730 and help out with our breakfast ministry, flipping pancakes, setting up tables, caring for people. For those of you that prefer it later, Help us out with our food pantry. You know, during this quarantine time, restaurants have had so much food that they've been giving it to the churches. And we have meat, cheese, eggs. We have so much stuff. And we need help, quite frankly, getting it handed out. And we do that after services. You know, it makes me think of the old proverb where the guy says, I used to be really upset that I had no shoes till I discovered the guy with no feet. You know, when you serve somebody else, pretty soon your own problems, by comparison, start to seem pretty small. You know, here's one that maybe you've not thought of, is that you also want to speak the truth of God to yourself. Now, how many of you talk to yourselves? I know you do, man. I pulled up alongside of you in your car. It's like, who are you talking to? And then I think, well, who am I talking to? <laughs> I'm talking to myself. You know, uh, depression can be the result of some of the negative self-talk we do. We make a mistake, and it's, ah, oh, man, you're so stupid. Nobody likes you. Are you ever going to get this right? And we're ver it's very self-degrading. And when you do that, it pulls you down. But, you know, David teaches us because he was moving towards a depressing moment, but he flipped the narrative. He changed 
the self-talk. Listen to what he says. This is in Psalms 42. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior and my God. David was talking to himself. What, why are you so down? Put your hope in God. Worship him. And, you know, we need to do that as well. Rather than this self-degrading talk, why are you down? Why are you depressed? Have you forgotten? God's favor is on you. God loves you. You are filled with the Spirit of God. God has a plan. God has a purpose for your life. You remind yourself of the truth of God. The next thing I want to say is this, is that we've got to learn to just give yourself fully to God. Most of you that are listening right now, those of you in the room, you've asked Jesus to come into your life. And you know, that is the most important first step, that you would do that. But did you know Jesus doesn't just want your heart? He wants you. He wants your whole life. And you know, you may be so depressed where you just want to throw your whole life away. Well, can I encourage you? Just throw it all into his hands because he wants you anyway. In Romans, it says this, Offer yourselves, therefore, to God as a living sacrifice. Would you say that with me? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. He says, this is your reasonable act of worship. This is even more than you singing songs. This is even more than you putting money in the offering, that you would put your life in the offering and offer it to God. You would offer it to him. And, you know, it's certainly something we need to do every day. You know the big problem with the living sacrifice, right? They, they crawl off the altar. <laughs> and so we need to come back and do that every day. It always makes me think of the story of the chicken and the pig. An unlikely pair, but they're walking down the road, and they come across this hungry kid, and they feel bad for him. They think, man, it would really be nice if we could, uh, you know, provide breakfast for this, for this boy. And so the chicken has an idea. He says, I got an idea. What do you say we serve him bacon and eggs for breakfast? And the pig says, that's easy for you to say. All you got to do is lay an egg. I mean, that is complete sacrifice on my part. That's going to cost me everything. And can I just tell you, man, when you throw your whole life into Jesus' hands, you will discover what joy is really about. He says, it's those that lose their life for my sake. Those are the ones that find it. Do you really want joy in your life? Then throw your whole life into his hands. You know, it's the swimming season, once the sun comes out, of course. And, uh, you know, when you get into a swimming pool, there's two ways to get in, right? The wrong way and the right way. The wrong way is you know, you're just going to kind of test it with your toes, and you're going to get in very slowly. That ain't the way to get in a pool, right? You got to leap in with both feet. It's a whole lot more fun, isn't it? And you know, with this Jesus thing, a lot of you, you've just been kind of testing it with your toes for so long, and it's time just jump in with both feet. Throw your whole life into his hands. And I can, I can encourage you right now, if you want to know where real joy is, that's where it's at. It's a lot more fun jumping in a pool with both feet, and it's a whole lot more jumping into Jesus with your whole life rather than just testing the waters out here on the peripheral. Amen? The last thing I want to talk with you about is this is that we may need to tear down some spiritual strongholds. You know, yesterday I was doing some gardening and pulling some weeds out around the house. And when I got to the dandelions, we all know this, man. Dandelions have very long roots. And what happens if you don't get the whole root? It just comes right back. That's kind of like what depression is like is that when you've walked in depression for a long enough time, pretty soon it starts to take root in your life. 
and it becomes what we call a stronghold, a spiritual stronghold. Scripture talks about don't let the devil get a foothold or get a handhold on your life. These are strongholds. And you know, in the book of Isaiah, there's a prophecy about Jesus coming. And let me read what this says for you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news, good tidings to the poor, to give them the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Did you guys catch that? Look how, look how he spells the word spirit. It is a small s. That is not the Holy Spirit. The spirit of heaviness is not from God, the Holy Spirit. This is from an evil spirit. This is from a spirit that is not of God. Okay, so let's talk about this for a moment. This spirit of heaviness. What's another way of saying heaviness? Depression. Exactly. I want to read for you what it says in Corinthians. It says, the weapons that we fight with, they're not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Did you guys catch that? We're talking about this stronghold of heaviness or this spirit of depression, but through Jesus Christ, we have the authority to obliterate these strongholds. Hallelujah. I want to wrap up by saying this to you, and then just a moment, we're going to worship and we're going to pray. But let me share this with you. Have you ever noticed that the new day starts in the dark. Have you guys ever noticed that? When does a new day begin? At midnight. When it strikes midnight, it is now, it, the clock now moves from p.m. to a.m. It's the beginning of a new day. Now, if you didn't have a watch and you were outside, you wouldn't know what time it was because 12 a.m. looks exactly the same as 11.59 p.m. But a wonderful thing happens at that very second that the clock strikes midnight. It is now shifted from p.m. to a.m. The old has been left behind, and it's now a new day. Now, from a fleshly perspective, it still looks dark. You cannot see anything different. It still looks the same, but it is not the same. Everything has changed. And, you know, this is a parallel, a picture of our lives, is that you may be in a place where it's very dark right now. All you see is darkness. You are depressed. It is heavy. It's weighing on your life. But I want to speak prophetically into your life that right now, this moment, that the clock has now struck midnight and it is now shifted from p.m. to a.m. and you are now moving into a new day and daylight is on the horizon. His peace, his favor, his goodness, it's all there. You've left the past behind and you're moving into the new thing God has for you. Amen? I'm going to ask if our worship team can come, and we're going to take a moment in prayer. You know, this morning, you may be in this room or you may be at home, and today is the day for you to recommit yourself to Jesus Christ, to say yes to him. That is the beginning of it right there. And I'm going to ask if you could pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I invite you to come into my life to forgive me of my sin, to wash it all away and give me a fresh start, that you would fill me with your spirit and that you would help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to pray for you on this depression issue. Is there anybody here today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed where you would raise your hand and say, yes, man, depression has been chasing me down like a dark dog. 
like a cloud has been trying to envelop me. Is there anybody here, you've been struggling with that? Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. Amen. And for you at home, I know some of you that are listening, that you've been battling depression. And I'm here to declare this is a new day. That the clock, the clock has now struck midnight. It may not look different, but it is now a new day. And the sunlight is coming. The favor is coming. The goodness is coming. Lord, I want to pray against this stronghold that it would be torn down. It says that you have given us divine power to demolish strongholds. And we pray, Lord, that by your word, by your promises, by your spirit, that there would be a wrecking ball, so to speak, that would demolish this spirit of depression. And in its place, there would be joy unspeakable, full of glory. There would be the freedom to praise, the freedom to worship, the freedom to live. Lord, I pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen.